So now having discussed our golden rule, which is that the most charged species will almost always react first, and having gone through those few exceptions with the spectator ions, which are the conjugate acid of those strong bases, going over the conjugate bases of strong acids, and discussing the diprotic amino acids as our three exceptions that you might encounter, we can now go into the next part of that, and that the most charged species will react first, and it will do that with the most strongly charged species of the opposite type. And when this reaction happens, a lot of times it will cause a new bond to be formed, and that will require some bond to be broken. And if this does require a bond to be broken, then you have to break the weakest bond. And the weakest bonds tend to be either pi bonds or very polar bonds. Those are the two you should look for. You should look for pi bonds or polar bonds as the two weak bonds that you will be breaking. And so here I have two examples of environments here and we can just kind of work through them. The first thing is when you see any K or any Na species, always be suspicious that that is a salt that is being used to deliver a negatively charged species. So here the KCN is going to dissociate into a K plus and a CN minus. And this K plus is one of our spectator ions. It's a highly charged species that is unlikely to react with carbon and so it often sits on the sidelines there. But what we do have is this cyanide ion which is a strong nucleophile. Remember that nucleophile means that it loves the nucleus. File means love, so nucleophiles love the nucleus. And because the nucleus is positively charged, a strong nucleophile is something that's looking for a positively charged thing around it, some nucleus nearby. What we have here with this ketone group is we have a partially negative oxygen and we have a partially positive car carbon right there, the carbonyl carbon there. And so what will most likely happen is the electrons from this cyanide group will go and attack at that carbonyl carbon. But as that happens, as the CN joins this group here, notice that that is forming a fifth bond. We have two here, we have the double bond there, and then we have this new bond that is being formed. And so the best way to resolve that stress will be one of two options. You either want to break the weakest bond or you want to boot out the attacker. But we have a weak bond that can be broken here and that is the double bond, the pi bond that is part of this CO group, the carbonyl functional group. And so what will happen is when this group attacks, you're going to see the electrons from that pi bond move up toward that oxygen. And so now the oxygen is going to go negative and it will have two electrons with it. And the CN group will now form. And so what will happen here now is you're going to have your, your CN group and that will be attached to this with an O minus. And that is the most likely thing to occur because we found our negatively charged species, remembering that it was being delivered by a spectator ion in the form of a salt. The negatively charged cyanide ion now comes and attacks and breaks that double bond, the pi bond from the carbonyl group. And then that causes the electrons from that to move up to the oxygen. And so now we have a situation where we now have attached the cyanide group to that but we still have a formal charge here. And the nice thing is that in a protic environment or in an aqueous environment or any environment where you have free floating protons around or where you have a richness of hydrogen, a lot of times the easiest way to deal with a negatively charged species like this on an oxygen is for it to simply find an H plus in its surroundings. And so what will end up happening is this O will end up picking up a hydrogen and that neutralizes its charge. And so now what we have here is a cyanide group that is attached to the same carbon as an alcohol. And that is a very common thing that we can break down using our first principles. We have a salt here that delivers the CN minus. The CN minus now is a very negatively charged species that is motivated to interact with something and it finds the partial positive carbon of that carbonyl group and attacks it. Once it attacks it, you are breaking a bond. 
and the bond that you break is going to be a weak one, so it will either be a pi bond or a polar bond. And so we'll break this pi bond, those electrons will move up here, and then the last thing we have to do is simply find a way to deal with the, those excess electrons on the oxygen. And oftentimes what you'll see when you have a negative charge like that, particularly on an oxygen, you'll find that it will pick up a proton for its surroundings if there isn't a better target nearby for it to interact with instead. So this is an example of a reaction that we can break down using our core principles that the most charged species will often react first. When it does, it tries to find the most strongly charged species of the opposite type. So here we have a CN minus, and it's looking for the most positively charged thing, which is that carbon. So it will react with that. And then if this does require a bond to be broken, because remember when we formed this new bond that created a five bond situation, you break the weakest bond and that will either be a pi bond, which is a fairly weak part of the double bond, or you will break a polar bond, one that isn't sharing electrons equally and thus isn't as strong as a perfect covalent bond that does share the electrons equally. Here's another simple example where we can apply these principles. And yes, this might be simpler than you might encounter in certain exams, but while we're going through the core principles, it's good to just see what the major pieces are. And right here, we have a sodium hydrosulfite and a alkyl halide that has a chlorine group attached. And so by now, your instinct should be that when you see an Na as part of a salt here, think that that is going to dissociate and yield a negatively charged species. And so that's what happens here. If you put this in water, you end up with an Na plus and an SH minus. And notice that that SH minus has an extra pair of electrons somewhere. Now, the negative charge there is looking for the most positively charged thing in its environment, other than our exceptions, one of which is Na plus, the spectator ion. So it's not going to rebond ionically with that Na+, but instead it's looking for something else that's positive in the vicinity. In this vicinity, what we have is this chlorine that is electronegative, so that is partial negative, and that turns this carbon there into a partial positive carbon. And because of that, now we have a negative charge here and a partial positive over there, and this is the most positively charged thing in the environment that isn't one of our three exceptions, being the spectator ions or the conjugate acids of our strong bases, of which Na plus is one of those. And so here, our negatively charged SH group will go and it will attack there. And the nature of this attack could be a SN1 or an SN2 or one of the nuances that we can discuss later. But right now, you can realize that this negative charge is going to go attack the positive charge. And when it does, that forms too many bonds. Because remember, there's an implied hydrogen here that isn't drawn in the skeleton structure. And so when this hydrosulfide group comes and attacks, that is forming a fifth bond. One, two, three, four, and then the new bond that is being formed here. And to resolve that stress, because we don't want five bonds with the carbon, the way that we resolve that stress is by breaking whatever the weakest bond is. And in this case, our weak bond is going to be the polar carbon to chloride bond. And the reason that that one is weak is because remember that a covalent bond, the strength of that comes from the fact that it's very favorable for two atoms to share electrons between them so that they both complete their octet. What happens here with the carbon and chlorine bond is that the Cl is a lot more electronegative, and so the electrons are spending a lot more time over here than being bound to that carbon. And because of that, that's a weaker bond because there isn't a perfect sharing going on. So because the electrons are more likely to be found near the chlorine, it's very likely that it won't be too much of a problem for that bond just to break and for those electrons to just stick with the chlorine. And that's what ends up happening. This comes here, the electrons bind with the chlorine, and what we end up with now is this species. We have the SH group there, and we still have our hydrogen there. But the Cl minus has now left with its electrons,
and it goes negatively charged. And this again is our species. And so this reinforces our core rule. Look for the most charged species in your environment. In this case, we have the spectator ion and the SH minus, which are tied for being the most charged because they have a formal charge. This is the one we end up with, this nucleophile SH minus group. And the SH minus is a nucleophile that wants to attack something positively charged. The most positively charged thing in its environment is going to be that partial positive carbon. And in doing so, because it makes a fifth bond, that requires that one of the bonds be broken. And in, when you're given a choice of which bond to break, always go for the pi bond, which is a weak one, or go for a polar bond, which is something where an electronegative atom is covalently bonding with something that's not as electronegative. The polarity difference there makes that a weaker covalent bond than usual. And so that ends up being the one that is broken. And so if you follow this rule that the most charged species will react first, if you're mindful of the few exceptions to that rule, and if you realize that when it does react, it will do that with the most strongly charged species of the opposite type, and that if that forms extra bonds, you want to break the weakest one, that gives you a very, very strong foundation, which I think is always the first way you should be looking when you encounter an organic chemistry problem.